Okay, so what you're looking at is uh, the China Files or the Virtual Field Trip Project of the Be of Beijing, where I taught last year. Uh, I took 16 students to the Forbidden City and the Ming Tomb, and stopped along the way, took videos, and then created this website. And you can see all of these on my website here. It's mrstuartralston.weebly.com. I'll tell you a little bit more about it. So all 16 of the videos are located on the website, and each video has associated with it a uh, transcript of what the student says and questions generated from the content of the lecture that they gave. And the transcript and the quiz were all created by the student. So from an uh, assessment perspective, the question is, why, why do this? What's the goal? What do you want the students to get out of this? So there are several goals in having the students create quizzes and do their own lectures. The first of which is just to practice public speaking. A lot of these students are ESL students, and so they need to practice their English. Uh, the second was to get facts about the Forbidden City, to get the feel of the Forbidden City, to see the opulence of the Ming Dynasty, and you'll see more about that in a little bit. The, the third is to have the students be the guides, to empower them to be the ones with the knowledge to share. Plus, I know all my high school students would rather listen to each other than listen to a tour guide, so this really gives them the opportunity to shine. The last goal of this project was to put it all into Google Earth and create a virtual field trip. Now with the click of a button and a web browser, a student, any student in the world can open up Google Earth and explore the Forbidden City in 3D and watch uh, any video that they say interesting to them. If they want to watch the Outer Court, they can watch that, the Golden River, whatever it is, they can select it, they can watch it, and then they can take the quiz and read the transcript give you a good idea what this looks like, I'll show you the first video here, uh, Meridian Gate. For those who don't know me, I mean, I'm Herbert, I'm one of Ms. Rasson's World History student, and I'm here right now in Forbidden City to introduce the Meridian Gate. Um, back to the history, Chinese emperors used to believe that this place where we are standing right now was the center of the universe. So now Elbert and the other 15 videos are available online through Google Earth. And just imagine if other teachers around the world start doing this project and uploading their videos to the same database, Google Earth, we would eventually have a student-led, student-driven, constructivist understanding of the major historical places all over the world. So now that you have an understanding of the virtual field trip project, let's talk about how I assessed student learning for the project. Now, what we did was, of course, the students were assessed on their speech, their quiz questions, and their transcript, and they had a whole rubric for each of those and what I was expecting from them. And then, not only did they have to write the quiz questions, but they all had to take each other's quiz questions and answer them, so they took notes during the field trip. The last one was a textbook assignment where we analyzed our our understanding of China in this time period and we read articles on it that uh, had different perspectives on it and then the students needed to weigh the importance of the different perspectives and narratives we were hearing and turn it into a one-page textbook. And there's an example of the textbook assignment in the materials that I included for Maya. What I'd like to do now is show you how the virtual field trip project fits into a much larger unit. So I was searching the internet one day and I came across a website from Columbia University on Asia for Educators. 
The point of this website is to take a look at the changes that started in the world in the 16th, 17th, 18th century and look at the role that different regions in the world had besides just the Europeans seeking spices. Now, this question was really engaging for me. Who was it that was really driving the change in the world in this time period? And I thought, well, if I'm engaged in the question, then perhaps my students will be engaged in the question. And instead of me finding the answer, I'm going to have them find the answer and answer it themselves. So in order for them to answer this question, they needed to have uh, facts to draw on. So my task in this was to scaffold the information for them. And I did this in a number of ways. The first thing to do was to jigsaw the world and just say, hey, what was happening at the time? They did collaborative group presentations, presented the information, and we had a general understanding of what was happening uh, in the 1500s to the 1750s. And then the next thing we did was study the textbook. The textbook, of course, has a very Eurocentric perspective uh, because that's just the norm in the United States textbooks that we were using. And then the last part was the virtual field trip, kind of a counterbalance to the textbook. With all this information, they were finally ready to answer the question of which region in the world was really driving the change at the time. So now my job is to figure out how to assess them on what we've studied. And I did this in two ways. The first was to create a debate where everyone in the class would participate. Students came in randomly assigned to one of three sides. Either China was driving all the change in the world, Europe was driving all the change in the world, or it was a combination of influences from new countries all over the world. The second way that I assessed them was on an individual level. The students needed to create a two-page student-made textbook that covered this time period, 1500 to 1750. The challenge here being that we've covered weeks of material and they've got pages and pages of notes, and they need to distill it down into just two pages to figure out what really is the most important at the time, which of course gets them to the question of who was driving the change in the world? Who should we focus on as historians? And that's it. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed hearing about this project as much as I enjoyed putting this little thing together for you. Uh, good luck in your careers, and have a wonderful day. City is very big and huge, and I think it's very fun. <laughs> Additionally, I would like to say that um, as a world history student, I'm so glad to come here because I get to expand my knowledge in history, and yeah, it's more. And more. I mean, it's going, it's not going to be difficult for me to forget this, but it will be easier for me to remember because. I connect the stuff I'm learning in class with the evidence which those evidence they are around me. So thank you for listening everyone. Uh, for me as a world history student, Bobina City is a really good place to learn and experience history of Ming Dynasty. I'm very honored to be here because it's the first time we ever go out of our classroom to learn about something and it's fun so yeah. Ooh. Lastly, to be in the Ming Tombs as a world history student, it means like I become a living witness of Ming Dynasty. I'm really happy to be here. Thank you. So, this place is really amazing for me as a world history student. And it's, I, think, I think I will never forget this place. As a world history student, I'm very happy to be here because I never been here first. I think this is very nice experience. It's, uh, and for me, for me, for Better City, it's very um, it's an honor to be here as a uh, live streamer. Well, as a world history class student, to be here it is like experiencing the living history with which I was learning in the classroom. 
for me, this filter is makes me more uh, easier to understand the world history. As a world history cl class student, I'm happy to be here because I could understand more about Chinese culture and history.